The world is filled with wounded people who don't know how to be who they are. They're not being themselves because they think whoever they are is not worth anything. And so they're pretending, trying to be somebody they're not, trying to be like somebody else, wearing masks, got a frozen smile on their face, acting like everything's all right when they're bleeding to death on the inside. And God doesn't want us to have to pretend. He wants us to get honest enough to receive the healing that's ours through the death and resurrection of Christ and then be a real person, an individual person, confident in who you are in Christ, not having to compete with anybody or compare yourself with anybody else. Can anybody say amen? amen. Now, got a statement for you. It's okay to not be okay. <laughs> you see, we desperately don't want people to know that we're not okay. <laughs> we want everybody to think that we have got it all together. I mean, I am the together person in the neighborhood. No problem, no problem. No worries, cool. But then when you become a Christian, the language is changing, but the problem's still the same. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> you go to church with your church face, with your frozen Holy Ghost smile. <laughs> your little Christianese that you've learned. <laughs> Oh, I know, Dave and I would fight all the way to church, hit the front door, praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Woo, woo, woo. Get back in the car, fight all the way home. I'd get mad at him because he wanted to watch football, and then I'd go back in the bathroom and cry all day, spend the next day depressed do that all week and then go back to church the next week. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, is anybody where I'm living? All right. But I tell you what, the Holy Ghost wants to take it apart. You better let him take it apart before you fall apart. And then let him put it back together so it's put in order right. You cannot get help from God if you will not admit that you need help. So the first thing we need to do is go to God and say, I love you, Lord. I appreciate my salvation, but I am a mess. And I want some truth. I don't want to live in deception. Here's another prayer to pray every day. God, open my eyes in any area where I am deceived and teach me truth. We'll talk a little bit more about deception in one of the other messages because we are so deceived in so many areas. And we think everybody else has got a problem. And it's your fault I'm not happy. And it's your fault I'm not happy. And if, if you would do this, then I wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> Psalm 109.22. Let's take a look at how honest David was. For I am poor and needy, <laughs> and my heart is wounded and stricken within me. I'm telling you, the psalmist David was shockingly real with God. As you read the psalms, you find that he was not playing a pretend game. Let me say again, it is okay to not be okay. If you are not okay, you don't have to pretend that you are okay. <laughs> you can say, I need help. I need help from God. James 5, 16 says, confess your faults to one another that you might be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Now, obviously, we know that we confess our sins to God and that our forgiveness comes from Him. But it's good sometimes to just talk to somebody and get some things out of you. The problem we have today 
is because loyalty and honor has gone by the wayside and integrity is a word that a lot of young people don't even understand. Many people find it difficult to find somebody that they can talk to and really trust that they're going to keep their secrets. But there are people. Choose wisely, but find a good friend, a trusted family member, a trusted spiritual leader, if you need to talk to somebody that you can talk to. I don't encourage anybody to go sit in counseling for 20 years, but if you need counseling, they're bound by law not to tell your secrets. <laughs> Sometimes we just need to vent. We just need to get it out. For years and years and years, I mean, I was in my 20s before I ever told anybody what had happened to me. What a lonely secret to live with that many years. Why did I not tell anybody? I was afraid of what they'd think of me. I was afraid that my dad fight, my, might find out that I told somebody. I was afraid that my mother might find out that I told somebody. That's exactly where Satan wants us living in fear. He wants to practically ruin our lives and then make us afraid that somebody will ever find out. Maybe you used to be in prostitution and now you're afraid that somebody will find out. Whatever the case might be. Secrets buried alive never die. They just keep eating at us. And there's value in this confess your faults to one another that you may be healed. Sometimes if you've just got something bugging you, the enemy's attacking you and you just can't seem to get beyond it. I remember one time when I was having a real problem with jealousy towards someone. And I didn't want to feel that way. It was stupid. But I did feel that way, and I couldn't get over it. And I just felt like the Lord put on my heart that I just needed to go and tell Dave and ask him to pray for me. Well, it's humbling sometimes to have to tell somebody what you're going through or what you've done. But it's in that very act of humility that we receive help from God. God helps the humble. God helps those who are willing to say, I need help. Don't stay in the dark by yourself. What you bring out into the light gets exposed. Very often when we have problems and we're hurting, we always blame it on somebody else. It's always somebody else's fault. That started in the garden, the blame game. And it's carried on in probably almost every person's life. I did it. I'm sure you do it. If I'm late for work, it's somebody else's fault. Somebody else at the house should have done something that they didn't do that then I had to deal with that then made me late. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Never occurs to us that maybe we should have gotten up early and <laughs> left a little margin in our life so we were, could account for some of those things that we didn't plan for. So don't let somebody blame you for their problems and don't blame somebody else for your problems. You say, well, it's not my fault. Somebody did this to me or that to me. Well, you know what? Maybe, maybe the way you are right now is not your fault, but don't let what happened to you become an excuse to stay that way. I mean, you know, when I started finding out that God cared about my whole life and this wasn't just a deal where I got saved and now if I could just muddle through and make it till I got to heaven, then I could have a mansion and a little bit of happiness. I was amazed when I found out that I had such a mess in my soul from the things that happened to me in my past and that there was a promise in the Bible to cover every single one of them, that there was not one of those pains that I had to live with, that God had it all covered and I needed to find out what was mine bought paid for and delivered by the blood of Christ and I needed to start opening up those packages and being able to enjoy the life that Jesus died for me to have so maybe you don't know that either maybe somebody drug you here tonight maybe they fed you and promised you all kinds of stuff if you'd come <laughs> but the thing is is now you're here and you're not out of the building yet. <laughs> when we come to a relationship with Christ, there's a divine exchange. 
Oh, I love it. He takes the bad stuff and gives us the good stuff. I'll give you an example. When I married Dave, I did not have a car. And Dave had a car. <laughs> now, as soon as I said I do, I had a car. <laughs> How many of you get it? You understand it now, right? All right. Well, see, when, when you say, I receive Christ, that's like saying, I do. And all of his goodness swallows up all of your nothingness. My not having a car got swallowed up by Dave's having a car. It was wonderful. All of a sudden, I had all kinds of stuff I didn't have before. <laughs> it's a good deal. <laughs> Jesus gives us joy for mourning, beauty for ashes, praise instead of depression, respect for ourselves instead of shame, forgiveness instead of blame, hope instead of despair, righteousness instead of guilt, and on and on and on and on and on. But you cannot keep the ashes and have the beauty. Now we're digging in. So what do you mean by that? Well, you know, if you want to have the beautiful life that Christ wants you to have, then you can't just get in a foul mood on Thursday and sit around all day and just think about all the junk that everybody's done to you your whole life and how ticked off you are and how you're going to get them back and you're going to shut them out and I'm not going to this and I'm not going to that. You got to get rid of your ashes. You give those up and you'll get the beauty. Amen. Amen. My brother died two or three years ago from alcohol and drugs and mental illness. He was nine years younger than me. Had every opportunity to have a wonderful life. He could have been here in this conference tonight working on our staff. Did for a few years, and I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but by the time they found him in this building, his body was extremely decomposed, and, and uh, so we had him cremated, and they sent his ashes back, and we took them to the most beautiful place that we could find and spread his ashes. We wanted him, he didn't have a very beautiful life, but we wanted his ashes to land up in a beautiful place because... We believe because of things that he had gone through in his past that God did receive him home. He had accepted Christ as his Savior. He just was a messed up guy. He just was a messed up guy. God is extremely merciful. I believe he understands our pain and even sometimes our messed upness. <laughs> and uh, Sometimes, you know, and I don't mean to use this in a wrong way at all, so don't be offended if you're doing this. I'm just trying to make an analogy. Sometimes when, when people have their loved ones cremated, they want to they keep their ashes sitting somewhere. And you, you can do that in your life. You can have the ashes of your past, and you can keep them somewhere. Maybe you don't pay attention to them often, but boy, sometimes you just want to go and look them over again. <laughs> I'm suggesting that you take the ashes from your past and you spread them somewhere and let them get turned into beauty. Amen. You see, where, where I put my brother's ashes, there's no way I could go back and collect them. <laughs> God wants you to walk out here tonight determined to never in your life spend one more night with the frogs. What? How did you get to frogs? <laughs> well, let's go to Exodus chapter 8. <laughs> I'm actually going to redo this message and call it one more night with the frogs somewhere. But... <laughs> Exodus 8. 
the Israelites in slavery in Egypt cried out to God to send them a deliverer, Moses, who was a type of Christ, sent to deliver them. Pharaoh, who would represent the devil, did not want to let them go. So God sent plagues one after another and said, you are going to have one miserable life until you let my people go. Well, one of those plagues was frogs. Now, <laughs> chapter 8, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they might serve me. And I'm here tonight to tell you that we're announcing to the devil, let God's people go that they might serve God. Amen? I'll be a mouthpiece for God tonight and say, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Amen? And if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your entire land with frogs. And the river shall swarm with frogs which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedchamber, on your bed, upon your people, in your ovens, in your kneading bowls, <laughs> and into your dough. God's painting a picture here. Frogs everywhere. <laughs> you know, if you have misery in your life, it's everywhere you go. <laughs> Frogs. Self-pity frogs, <laughs> anger frogs, bitterness frogs, hateful frogs. Come on, who's getting it? Frogs. All right. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the rivers, the streams, the canals, and over the pools, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same thing with their enchantments and secret arts, and they brought up more frogs. Now, I thought this was interesting because it's kind of like Pharaoh, instead of just praying, God, I get it, get rid of the frogs. He turned to people to solve the problem, and all they did was make more frogs. Come on. When you go to people to solve your problems that only God can solve, you're only going to get frogs on top of your frogs. <laughs> I mean, can you get a picture? Frogs in your bed. Frogs nibbling on your toes. Verse 8, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my people. And I will let your people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Now get ready. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Glory over me in this. Dictate to me when I shall pray to the Lord for you, your servants and your people, that the frogs may be destroyed from you and your houses, and then they will remain only in the river. Moses said, Okay. When do you want me to ask God to get rid of the frogs? And Pharaoh said, tomorrow. <laughs> now, do you want to spend one more night with the frogs? <laughs> Why would Pharaoh want to spend one more night with the frogs? Why didn't he say, pray right now, right this minute? Who in this building tonight is going to say, not one more night with the frogs. You know what? Tomorrow is possibly the most dangerous word in our English language. Tomorrow. Let's get rid of the frogs tomorrow. Let's just go to bed with them one more night. Come on, are you with me out there? When are you going to forgive the people that hurt you? When are you going to stop saying it's too hard? It's too much. It's not fair. Right now. Right now. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad.
What is the most important moment in your life? Many of you would say the day that I received Christ. For many of you, that would be tonight. Some would say when I got married, when I had my kids. You'd all be wrong. The most important moment in your life is this moment right now. Because it's the only one that you know for sure that you have. All of yesterday's moments are done. You can't go back and undo what people did to you. But you can make a decision tonight that you're not going to spend one more night with the frogs. You're not going to let what somebody did to you 20 years ago keep ruining your life. You're going to press in and you're going to get the beauty for ashes, the joy for mourning, the praise for heaviness. Amen. You know, Jesus fed several thousand people with a little boy's lunch. And uh, it wasn't nearly enough to feed the crowd. There was only a few loaves of bread and just a few fish, thousands of people. But the little boy said, I'll give you my lunch if you can do something with that. And of course, Jesus miraculously multiplied it. It was enough to feed all the people. And there's a thing there that if you will just give God what you have, even if it's not enough to fix the problem, even if all you can give him tonight is your broken, messed up, miserable life, <laughs> He'll do something miraculous with it, and he can use even your broken past to end up feeding a lot of people. Amen? I'm feeding you tonight the Word of God. I'm breaking bread with you, so to speak. And it's multiplying, it's going to you, and it's going to those millions of people that watch by TV. And An amazing thing happened when Jesus had finished feeding all the people, they gathered up 12 basketfuls of fragments, just little broken pieces. And Jesus said, gather up the fragments that nothing be wasted. And here's what I want to say to you. If you feel like your life is just a fragmented mess tonight, if you'll let Jesus gather that up, He'll make sure that nothing in your past is wasted. Your pain will become somebody else's gain. Your mess may become your message. What you've walked through may become your miracle and certainly somebody else's miracle. You know, for many years, I said, well, if only I wouldn't have been abused. If only I wouldn't have been abused. You know, when Lazarus died, his sister Mary said to Jesus, if only you would have been here, Lord, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus, why weren't you here? So often we say that. Well, why, weren't, why didn't you help me when I was in that situation? Why didn't you help me when I was being abused? I prayed. I asked God to get me out of it. He didn't. He could have. He didn't. Well, Joyce, how can you not be mad at God? Because he's a whole lot smarter than I am. And I'll tell you something. Now, listen. He didn't, he didn't get me out of it, but he got me through it. Come on now. I'm going to tell you something. He got me through it. And I want to tell you something. Now, just wait. I got me some experience with God. And now, God's taken that broken mess and right here, right now, this message, my healed life, my restored life, this one message has the potential to start millions of people off in a right journey of healing in their life. And you know what? If God would have just gotten me out of it and what I wanted to get out of it, it would have been nice. I wouldn't have got hurt, but I wouldn't have this message tonight. I wouldn't have this message. And you know what? I don't know how God works all that out, and I know sometimes it doesn't seem fair to us, but I'll tell you one thing. Whatever I lost, oh, honey, let me tell you, God has given me double for my trouble. Amen? And he's going to do the same thing for you. No more frogs!
Well, I believe it's time to make a decision to walk out of bondage, leave the frogs behind, and find the freedom that Christ died for you to have. Don't live in your past pain for one more day. We are in Madagascar today and I want to show you something really beautiful. These are children who are part of the Hand of Hope feeding program here in this village. They receive a solid meal every day. Now, let me tell you, sometimes when you hear one meal a day, is that really much? It is so much more than you can even imagine. Look at these children. They're seated at a table where they are served a, a good, solid meal. And when their bellies are filled, that's something that cannot be taken away from them. But it's even more than that. They're receiving love and respect. They need to understand that they are valuable and that there is a God out there who knows them and loves them and has a good plan for their life. You're part of making all that happen. It's a lot more than you think it is when you look at it, and we appreciate so much what you do through Hand of Hope to help us help these kids. Vind je het moeilijk om te bidden? Te ingewikkeld? Bidden kan zoiets moois zijn. Praat met God eenvoudig over alles. Een boek van Joyce Meyer kan jou hierbij helpen. De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed. Leer hoe je met God over alles kunt praten. Je kunt het boek De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed nu bestellen via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch op 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.